reversed. Greetings, I'm Shad, and let's do a deep dive on the types of food a medieval adventurer would eat while traveling and on his adventures. Now, what's fun about this subject, it's actually kind of also a bit of a broader subject, on medieval food, because that's what I'll be focusing on. If we're going to be doing medieval fantasy, let's look at what they actually ate in the medieval period, but more, even though we're looking more broadly at the medieval period, we're going to be a bit more specific to uh, longer lasting foods that you'd be able to eat while you're traveling. Because the whole subject of medieval culinary, 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 is that the word? Uh, is, is very broad and we won't be covering everything, but we will be covering the types of food that were available in the medieval period and that people were able to use for traveling, for rations that would last longer. And so that means, no, we're not going to be looking at potatoes or tomatoes, no corn, no sugar. Well, it's funny, sugar was uh, very rare in the medieval period. Um, and also, uh, we wouldn't be looking at the uh, food that's more expensive. We'll be looking for food that is uh, more easily available for the commoner, the adventurer, because they wouldn't be forking out massive amounts of money for the expensive food of the day. So not only will there be foods that you think might have been common but aren't, and so, you know, oh look, I love Lord of the Rings, it's fantasy, and I guess that's the caveat that should be mentioned. Because, you know, you're dealing in fantasy, you do have the freedom to introduce foods that weren't actually in the medieval period, but if you wanted to give it a more authentic medieval evil flavor, pun now intended, uh, you would want to use uh, more authentic food. But you know, Lord of the Rings it has taters. What's taters, precious? All right, so you can do it, it's fantasy. But it's good to point out that, well, no, potatoes is not a medieval food. So a lot of tropical food you wouldn't find, so no bananas either and stuff. Though some fruits, you might be surprised, actually are medieval types of fruits. For instance, they had plums. There was European types of plums. And I'll go into more detail when we get into the specifics. But just on the matter of climate, that was also going to affect it. So, uh, for instance, dates is a, is a good example. But dates you only find really in warmer kind of climates, as well as, uh, like, interestingly enough, citrus. Uh, <laughs> the medieval orange. It's not the same as the orange that we think of. It's actually a very bitter type of fruit that would only be really palatable and eatable when you boil it down and actually uh, cook it and work with it. Uh, just by itself, not the nicest thing. And uh, references to orange in medieval texts, you need a, it's not our orange, okay? It's actually, yeah, a, a different type of orange. Because that's the thing, food evolves and changes over time. And a lot of the fruits and foods that we have in the modern day have been carefully cultivated by basically eugenics, but on fruit. It's food, so you can do it, right? Where it modifies it, okay, through breeding and selection and things. And because uh, like the bananas you eat, right? Have you noticed that there's, bit, there's no seeds in bananas, or if there are, they're the tiny little black specks. They're sterile, okay? We've, been, we've bred bananas, so they're sterile and we don't have to deal with the seeds. But that means to actually have banana trees, we need to clone the trees. Um, yeah, clone trees, right? Actual bananas have big seeds, like that, that's a um, an actual fruitful banana, right? And so we change them a lot. And one of the really kind of contrasting things, for instance, melons. Yeah, there were melons and stuff in the medieval period. But have a look at paintings of a watermelon from the, even the Renaissance, and have a look at it. The flesh in that, there's barely any red flesh, okay? And we have grown and modified our fruit by selection, okay, to make them into a lot more edible, a lot sweeter oftentimes, where you select for uh, the amount of pulp or flesh on the fruit, the flavor as well. And so things change over time. And so some of the foods and fruits and things that I'll be mentioning here uh, will be slightly different. And where I know the differences, I'll mention them. And if I miss uh, a couple, uh, share in the comments below if you know them as well. On the note of expensive food, it's actually remarkable how cheap and affordable some really great food is in the modern day in contrast. And one of the things that really stand out to me is like spice. Do you know how prized cinnamon was in the medieval period? Well, you're probably coming here to find that out. Yes, cinnamon was very prized in the medieval period, as well as other spices. They often came from very far off places and as a result were very expensive and prized in the upper class. But as I mentioned, in the modern day, we can get access to all those spices at a very affordable cost. But what's interesting is that we often don't take advantage of the great culinary uh, options we have available because we get stuck into the basic run-of-the-mill stuff that we usually get into, which is why the sponsor of this video is not only very topical, but also will help you open up your options in your diet. And that is HelloFresh. For this HelloFresh, we are cooking uh, crumbled chicken dippers. 
I first tried HelloFresh long before they were ever a sponsor, and it was through a similar promo as the one I'm able to offer to you through this sponsorship. I was able to get a free meal, I tried it out, I loved it, and I've been using it ever since. I mean, it's free food, why not give it a go, and it's really delicious. With this meal, it's not necessarily all uh, medieval ingredients. That's some of the, so, so, sweet potato, okay? But we are using a very medieval uh, rosemary. Authentic medieval flavouring, which was actually very available, you know. Didn't have to be rich to have, get the hands of rosemary. And for me, there were heaps of reasons to keep using it. There are so many delicious recipes to choose from each week, and it really did help break up what we were eating. There is this recipe rut that you just naturally fall into where you resort to the easy, quick, tasty recipes, but they usually weren't too healthy. HelloFresh opened up the variety of our diets with really nutritious, healthy, and delicious food. Do you know why they call it sea salt? Because it's... No, I don't actually. You see it. I see salt! I'm about to commit assault. You get it? I will, I will, I will commit an assault right now. I committed an a, a, a assault. I committed a assault. I'm salting this thing. I... Do you get it? It saves time and is really effortless. HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from every week including vegetarian, calorie smart, and gourmet options. <laughs> it's just heaps of variety. Wait till the pan gets hot before you put the olive oil in. No. No, no, that's how, otherwise it'll spit. Otherwise it'll spit, Shad. Is this triggering you, Oz? Is this triggering you? I turn that down a bit by you, by the way. No! Who's cooking here, Oz? You're gonna burn it. The thing is, you can actually do a lot of this with, you know, medieval tech, like, Flour, of course they had, eggs they had. Again, you can make a nice spice mix with flavors and things. Also, to keep in mind, the holidays are approaching and they can be hectic. Oh, it's spitting! It's spitting fire in my face! I'm burning! Shut up! I can't see it. Backseat anymore. cooker. Backseat cooker. But HelloFresh helps keep things simple with recipes and ingredients that cut out grocery shopping and reduces meal prep time so you can spend more time in the festival season with friends and family. Are you going to toss that salad? I'm, I, man, I am such a salad tosser, you could almost call me just a tosser. Also, by using HelloFresh, it actually cuts down your food waste by at least 25% compared to grocery shopping. And I've experienced that in my own life. There are many things that we buy when we go grocery shopping that we don't end up using fully in the meals that we make, and we end up just throwing out. Look at that, lovely. And you can try this out too. All you have to do is go to hellofresh.com slash shadowversity14 and use code shadowversity14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. It's delicious, it's totally worthwhile, and hey, free food. So why not give it a go and thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. All right, fellas, dig in. Hey, Ollie. Mm. Mm. I really like our olive. Mm. Use a fork, you bloody animal! I'm eating like I did in my leave time. Actually, they did eat a lot with their hands. You're right. There you go. But they did have the fork. Not a lot of people use it, but and it was like a, a dual pronged fork. It was more like a. Skewer. I'm not a med I'm not a medieval king. Okay, I'm a I'm a I'm a dude who, you know. I certainly use spoons. Can't finish it off either, huh? I'll finish it. <laughs> I just need that moment of digestion. <laughs> mm. My tummy's so full now. Oh. It's very good stuff. Very good stuff. Mm. So, that's HelloFresh? Mm -hmm. Wow. You sound so fake. Okay. That's HelloFresh? <laughs> wow! <laughs> Okay, did the first one. Yeah. The first one. Oh, we're keeping both in. <laughs> Definitely. No, seriously, that's great. It's really good. And I'm serious about that. I used HelloFresh well before they sponsored me on the channel. So this is something I can recommend wholeheartedly. And it did exactly that. It actually, it one, improved my diet, but also the food that we're eating was just more varied and more nutritious and delicious on top of that as well. So I really recommend it. All right, let's get back to food that an adventurer would eat from a more kind of medieval history historical perspective, both things that you can forage, but things that you can take with you as rations. So the first kind of obvious thing before we actually get to rations that you will store and carry with you, which obviously there's going to be those, but 
there's going to be foraging, okay? The rations are longer lasting, and so they should really be the last resort. These are the things that you eat when you can't find anything else because they'll last longer. But if you come across food that you can simply forage, catch or hunt, definitely going to get that first and eat it first because you don't have the means to preserve them so they last longer. So looking at native European types of foods, and this is foods that you could find in Britain or Europe, sometimes in both locations, but sometimes in one or the other. Uh, definitely many types of berries, so you're looking at Blackberries, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, red currants, cowberries, elderberries, and then some berries I've never even heard of, like Roma berries, hawthorn berries, and things. But yeah, medieval berries, you can forage them, find them, and of course, these would really only be in the summer, so the time of year would be important for these ones as well. Uh, nuts, though, you can certainly forage for nuts, hazelnuts, acorns, walnuts, and there's one called beech nuts, I think. Beech must, they are, and they look a bit like chestnuts. Now, aside from berries, nuts, there's also fruits, of course. One of the more common ones that you'd be able to find would be apples, but here's a bit of a difference, okay? The more common type of apple of the medieval period would be more like a crab apple than the actual fleshy big apples we have in the modern day. There are some examples of possible, you know, early predecessor types of these apples around in this time, but crab apples are far more common. There's also grapes, pears, plums, cherries, and all of them would vary by region or climate, but there's a good variety of fruits, berries, nuts, all that you could try and find, uh, and <laughs> it'll be much more successful in the summer, of course. In fact, I found an interesting reference called uh, the Neutralis Historia. It's a period source that lists the types of fruits that are, uh, you know, available in Italy specifically. 15 varieties of olive, the pomegranate, peach, grape, 12 kinds of plum, 30 kinds of apple, 41 kinds of pear, 29 varieties of figs, nuts, which is more the generic term for uh, walnut, hazelnut, and al almond, the chestnuts and cherries, and a few fruits that uh, we don't really have around the modern day. The sorb, and also the carob, which is the fruit of the European cornel. There's a lot of vegetables that you could forage as well, and a lot that you're probably don't really are aware of because they're more kind of considered now survival food, the way it's not cultivated a lot, but there are cultivated greens you'd be able to find, such as Brussels sprouts, cabbage, beans, peas, onions, turnips, and many more. In addition to the types of things that you can forage, then there are sitting traps and also hunting if the adventurer has time, rabbit being a very, you know, common and available one, also the pheasant, and uh, sometimes even rat and mice if uh, the adventurer is particularly hungry. But then there is a larger game that can hunt. Boars can be a bit dangerous if you're going after wild boars, all right? They, uh, <laughs> they can be actually very dangerous animals. Uh, but deer as well, if it's actually legal to even hunt deer in the area you are in. Is this a king's forest? But these are just a number of examples of food that you could find along your travels, which I think the average adventurer is always at least going to grab some, like, especially if he's traveling and he passes like a berry bush or a couple of nice greens that he could throw into, you know, uh, the food at night, everything, you just grab along the way, just pause for a couple of minutes, grab what you want, put them in pouches and stuff. Uh, as you're traveling, especially if you also see game and you have, you know, the equipment to be able to take him out, like a bow or something, you see a rabbit just there, venture is a pretty good shot, you know, and there, there, there's dinner. And then you have longer lasting kind of preserved foods that you can fall back on. But not only that, you would actually kind of combine them because uh, if you're foraging along the way, you'd actually want to try and push the food to, uh, to go a bit further. And also some of the, um, rations that you can store are not very tasty and so you'd want to combine them and mix them up and this is where we come to just what about basic flavoring and i think the average adventurer would always carry like a pouch of salt or some garlic cloves all right uh salt of course very common in the medieval period it was not worth as much as gold lloyd of lindy beige actually has a great video and while we're giving shout outs if you want to see some in-depth kind of examples of historical food not just from the medieval period but from many areas check out tasting history it's a phenomenal YouTube channel and he actually finds period recipes, makes them as accurate that is as he can, and then also gives a bit of a taste as well. Awesome guy, brilliant channel, check that out as well if you want even further kind of examples of historical food that you can adapt into your fantasy, whether that's something you're writing or you're role playing or anything. So as I was saying, I think every adventure would definitely be carrying salt. The amount, it will vary. Sometimes you'd only want to carry enough to uh, flavor your food, but you might actually want to carry some so you could preserve 
some food along the way as well. Salt is a great preservative. It draws out the moisture from the food and it can preserve food up to months. And so imagine, you know, if you uh, nabbed a deer and uh, look, a deer will already provide way too much meat for you to, for, to carry just a regular person, but if you've got a pack animal, but if you just wanted to dry or preserve a good haunch of the deer, okay, you just need to rub salt around it, put it in a sack. And as long as it's covered in salt, you don't need the sack full of salt. So if you had like a pouch of salt, maybe yay big, that might actually be enough to preserve some stuff. And then you have like a whole haunch of meat that you can carry with you on your horse or whatever. And that could provide food for easily maybe a week or more. In terms of flavoring, okay, there's actually things that an adventurer could forage. And if they've grown up in this world, just like a medieval person, they'll be aware of the types of flavoring that they could find along their travels. And if they see it, they might just grab some as well. Hey, I'll chuck that in my stew tonight because it is a huge misconception. I hate this and I've come across it more than once where people think the food of the medieval period was bland, tasteless and dull. And it's not. I mean, well, a good example, watch some of the videos from Tasting History. But not only that, like they had salt people, they loved garlic and man, garlic is one of the great flavors. I love garlic, right? Just garlic steak, garlic pork, you know? But there are also a whole heap of other very affordable, easily accessible flavoring options. Mint, thyme, oregano, rosemary, chives, horseradish, basil, pepper, sage, nutmeg, ginger. And that's not to mention other flavor additions that you can find along the way, like uh, honey, eggs, milk, cream. If you, uh, those don't last too long, but you can still carry some with you for a day or two. But eggs, that'll last a good couple of days, but they could be fragile. Cheese and butter though, my goodness, that'll last a good while. And remember, you can flavor your food with the other sweet things like fruits and berries as well. They might also carry a bit of honey with them on top of that. And honey basically lasts forever. And this is just some examples of the wide variety of the herbs they, they can add to give flavor to their food as well as other things. And so you could make some banging dishes in the medieval period. And as to the adventurer, well, if he just had a couple of these things or he finds along the way, hey, there's a bit of sage, grab some sage along the way. Oh, rosemary, oh, hey, look at that. And people would be very familiar with these things. So covered a lot of things that you can find along the way in terms of foraging, hunting, trapping. Um, uh, and did I mention fish? Of course, you would be catching fish if you're near a water source. And this comes up to the next part is actually water, all right? Not every water source was clean in the medieval period, but it's an utter misconception to say that none of them were clean. There would have been so many clean sources of water in the medieval period and people drank water a lot. We kind of live off water, all right? Uh, the I've already addressed this in, uh, well, I think it's my first medieval misconceptions video where people say that medieval people only drank ale, all right? Now, of course, there were some risks of unclean water. And if you didn't have access to clean water along your travel, that would be the preference. But if you don't have access to it, you need to carry some with you. So definitely in type of water skin or water containing vessel. And when you carry water with you, there is actually a chance the water, it could be clean when you first get it, but water can turn bad. All right. There are certain microbes and germs and everything that can grow and multiply, uh, depending how it's stored. That can it can just go sour, bad, and you can get sick drinking it. And so one of the things that we see historical people doing, like for instance Romans even did this, adding some alcohol or other types of things to the water to help kill germs basically. They weren't aware of germs, but they knew it helped preserve the water. And it wouldn't be like, you know, just carrying wine with you, it would be very watered down, but they would add wine to it or ale, sometimes vinegar. Okay. And yeah, I, vinegar water was a thing and it helped preserve the water, made it last longer. It's not to say they just drank straight vinegar. Gee, I wonder what that would be like. Uh, but uh, all right. So preserving, keeping water clean. And this is a fun, interesting thing that you might want to do if you're role playing or something like that is just roll a chance to see if the water or rations they are carrying, something could go, you know, could uh, certain bugs get into them or could the water turn bad? Did they take account? Did they preserve it right? Now the players probably wouldn't know this, but if they're playing characters in the world, they would most likely be aware of these normal everyday things that you do in life to just get by. And so you could pretend that they just do it automatically, but it's good to just be aware of it and all of it, especially for writing stories and things. And so with water covered, we come to the actual rations you can carry. And you might have noticed I have some food in front of me and these are 
choice examples of types of longer lasting food that would be some of the first options I feel a medieval adventurer would carry. And we start right here where the more affordable food, okay, is food that is derived from grains, primarily wheat or barley, but you're not going to carry raw wheat or barley with you because it takes time to prepare and it's nowhere near as dense and it's also heavy, okay, by actually processing the wheat and barley take, you know, grinding it down into flour uh, and then cooking it, you make the nutrition far more dense. Now, in terms of bread, though, bread actually has a decent amount of air in it. Eh? It can be very fluffy. And so bread isn't the best thing that you would carry because it would take up too much room. You would want dense types of bread, like flat breads and other types of wheat flour derived things like um, they would have had something like hardtack. Hardtack is a more modern term and this is uh, just a water cracker but it's a, it's a placeholder for hardtack which is basically um, uh, flour, water, salt, baked and it's really stiff, really hard. It lasts for a good long time, all right? And I think stuff like this, many people have known of it for a good while and so that would be one of the first things and uh, hardtack like biscuits or crackers would be uh, a pretty affordable not very tasty, but if you're looking at some of the cheapest, long-lasting, readily available food, yeah, just like this, and eventually I'd have it in the pouches. It wouldn't be too palatable, but there are other ways you can do it to make it m more enjoyable to eat because I'm not saying this wouldn't be the only thing especially if the adventurer you know traveler has a bit more money to spare but if they got nothing else they could live off of simple cooked flour that was combined with a bit of water and salt and uh, and well uh, you got a really solid kind of thing or again like so dense types of breads as well would be common on top of that because the main theme or rule of thumb that you'd have with rations is things that don't weigh too much but are dense and so dense can grow weight but if it's dense it has high nutritional value for little volume and that means a lot of dried foods okay and so I've got dried fruits here and if you wanted something sweet easy to eat dried apples okay uh, you could have uh, dried plums as well things like that very very common and so just for something sweet a pouch of just some dried fruits as well dried meats and this is smoked meats dried meats and so also other types of preserved meats like salami is a type of preserved meat that lasts a good long while and jerky okay that'll last you a good while and ham would be the more common type of uh, meat yeah because that's what the more common meat was for average people in the medieval period pork ham pig it was eaten a lot and then of course we have cheeses. Now there are some foods that I'll mention a little bit later that you might not think were actually uh, eaten just by themselves but they really were historically because their nutritional density is very high and they last for a good while. But before we get there there is of course the idea of just combining it because if you have water and this would depend if you had the means to prepare or cook because the adventurer might not have it any cookery with him, all right? So no pots, no pans or anything. He just kind of, if he catches a rabbit, he makes a uh, spit out of some tree branches, sticks or whatever, and then he just needs to eat his rations a bit raw right out of his pouches and stuff. But if you had at least like a, a pot or a pan, and this could include like a ceramic jug. Medieval people often cooked in ceramic jugs and they were called pottages. And so a pottage is basically a stew cooked in a type of vessel, all right? very common in the medieval period. And if you had anything like that, well, that's when you could probably improve your options if you had, because what you can do to uh, thicken up a stew is chuck some hardtack or whatever that's flour derived, it'll boil and then render down in the stew, thicken it up, adds more nutrition, you're adding flour to it and everything like that, and it's a lot better than just eating raw baked flour like that, and you can have a, a somewhat nice stew, especially if you've got, you know, dried meat, okay, it's a bit hard and tough, but as soon as you put it in a stew, it infuses the moisture back into it, makes it soft, makes it more enjoyable, and then you can find all those flavor options along the way, add salt and everything in, and so, you know, I think it'd be fairly easy for an adventure to just carry some type of pot or something to just throw things that he finds along the way. If he has water, bang, you can make a stew, you can make it really flavorful, make it enjoyable, nutritious, and you can carry then some very dense, nutritious, long-lasting supplies, but make them more enjoyable to eat at the end of the day. Because I don't think adventurers, I mean, if they have no other option, 
they're going to eat whatever they have to survive, but if they can improve the, the taste a bit along the journey, and it's not too much effort if they only need to carry some type of vessel to do it, I think they would. And then they can add other things, like cheese is a very dense, longer lasting uh, type of food, and that can add a lot of flavour to a stew, and it can just be eaten by itself, of course. And then you might be carrying some other things that you might not have really thought of that could have been just base food that you ate raw by itself. And yeah, so what I'm talking about, lard and say butter. Both those things have huge nutrition in them. Lard is basically just fat. But if you wanted to eat something that had huge amounts of energy that can keep you going, and yes, guess what? Sometimes Roman legionaries were just given a ration of lard as part of their daily food intake, all right? And butter as well. Sometimes people just ate butter straight. High nutrition, very dense, lasts a good while. Um, there we go. Breaking down some of the common rations, of course, you would have hardtack like uh, biscuits and crackers, flatbreads, dried fruits, dried or smoked meats, cheeses, and anything that you can really forage along the way. And we, you have a fairly good basis for the types of rations an average medieval adventurer would logically have. Of course, I don't think I've covered everything. Is there anything I missed? Are there some common types of foods, rations, long-lasting things that you could share in the description below? I mean, I was going to talk about pemmican, but pemmican is a later kind of period thing, and it's basically dried meat with lard mixed together and then dried again into like these bricks, lasted for ages, had heaps of, heaps of nutrition in it. I didn't find any reference of pemmican, uh, like pemmican again is more 18th century. Townsend's, a uh, great YouTube channel again, has videos about pemmican, how to make it and stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if the medieval period had a pemmican-like kind of thing made, because it's literally just dried meat and lard kind of put together. Lasts a good long while. Uh, but I haven't found any references for it. And so, but it's still really interesting about long lasting kind of trail food that you can find. And I'm mentioning it because remember, you are in fantasy. And so, if you wanted, you could, if you do it knowingly, add certain things that perhaps weren't in the medieval period into your own fantasy if you wanted it, if it suited the setting you're working with, uh, or if you could justify it. And so, it's kind of good to know what other options are there. And I'd love to hear some of the things that you could share in the comments below as well. Yet, of course, if you want a wholly more authentic kind of representation of the, what the medieval period was like, and you're doing fantasy that is very medieval inspired, I hope you have a good kind of basis to go off. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And of course, I hope to see you here on the next video on Shadowversity. So until that time, farewell.